answer session. Have some Q and A. If anybody has any questions, they'd like to ask anything at all. Uh, Torah question, personal question, any anything anybody would like to ask. Yes, Ailey, but serious questions. Uh, uh, what's your favorite, is this a serious question? What's your favorite parsha and why? What's my favorite parsha and why? It's a good question. My, the, the first thing is that there. It's an interesting question. My favorite parsha. So um, the 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 first thing is we never there's a, the Gemara actually says we don't say that we enjoy one piece of Torah more than another. You don't say because all of Torah is one. We don't say oh I like this Gemara. I don't like this Gemara. I like this. This is my favorite Gemara. That sort of thing, because it's all one Torah. So we don't say that. But having said that. Uh, having said that, I do have a certain fondness uh, uh, for Parshas Emor um, because that's the one that discusses how you have to respect in uh, Kohanim, yeah. right? So there, there is a certain, you know, I do have a certain place in my heart for, uh, for that one. But there's no, we, we don't look at one favorite over the other. And the more Torah you learn, you see, sometimes people have asked me, oh, you know, what do you do when you're teaching, par when you're teaching the Parsha? How do you teach Vayikra? Uh, which is very technical, as opposed to Bereshis and Shmos, which is more uh, more narrative. You know what I tell you? I don't know. I find far I, I find something. You know, there's so much depth here, as we've seen. There's so much depth in all areas of Torah that that that, that it doesn't really make a difference what you're learning, uh, because when you're learning Chumash, there's there's a tremendous amount of depth in everything. So it's not uh, you know it doesn't it's not it's not one more than the other. Some of it's a little technical at the surface level. But when you get into what the symbolic meanings are, the depth of it, and so on and so forth, so it doesn't really make a difference. Same thing when it comes to Gemara. The bottom line with Gemara is it's all hard. All Gemara, some guys say, wow, this is a hard Masechta. I've never, I have yet to meet a Masechta that's not hard. Right? Some are more practical, you know, you cover more practical. The Masechta Shabbos, you know, you know they, they're more practically applicable in today's day and age than two guys fighting over a talus. Right or you know to get you know so maybe it's a little more practical or 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 or, or, or the thickness of the mortar between the bricks and Baba Basra you know you know so maybe Shabbos the laws of Shabbos are more practical but when you start studying the laws of Shabbos there's also endless there's also endless with the laws of Shabbos right exactly when is it called separation and what's called you know and what's called cooking on Shabbos it's, uh, there's no uh, there's no one is favorite than a having said that though there are areas of Torah that one gravitates to more than others. That, yes. In other words, some people gravitate more towards the analytical type of learning in Gemara. Some people more gravitate more towards practical halacha. And you have a personality, and your personality takes you in a certain direction in learning. That, yes. That, yes. Different, different people have different gravity. That, that, you can say, this is my, that's a tendency. It's not my favorite. That, that's a tendency to move in a certain direction. And that for sure is true. Some people tend to you have more of a tendency to, 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 to try to accumulate knowledge. Others have a tendency to try to pierce deep, deeper, deeper understandings, that sort of thing. That, yes. Yes, sir? Do you have a method for processing big life decisions, or do you have any... any do I have a method for processing, the, do you mean making big, life decisions? Yeah, yeah. yeah, processing life decisions. So my father, Oliver Shalom, was a very wise man, he said to me, the most difficult thing about life is making decisions. That's the most difficult thing, because you make decisions all the time. And the most difficult thing in life is making decisions, hundred for, for sure, 100%. And one, my own personable method, whether you're going to like it, whether you're going to believe me or not, uh, uh, before I was married, uh, I made my own decisions, most of them incorrect ones. Uh, most of them ridiculous ones, emotionally laden decisions. And after I got married, I make the right decision. I asked my wife what to do. I let my wife make decisions because women have a better track record than men when it comes to making decisions. And I think I've explained this. I've explained this uh, 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 several times, but it's something very important for those of you, those of you who are planning on getting married uh, soon. So it's very important. Uh, somebody once said, "You know what a bachelor is." A bachelor is a guy who never made the same mistake once. You didn't get that? I thought that was profound. The, uh, what do you call it? So a, uh, a, a, a uh, uh, you know, because when you get married, the they say the difference between a wife and a bandit is a bandit says it's either your money or your life. And the wife wants both. So the, uh, the uh, what do you call it? The, 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 uh, the truth of marriage is, which I've mentioned many times, Men have an ego. 
and men think they always know best, and men think they always know right. Now, I will give you an example, see if you can follow this, uh, this keen Talmudic reasoning. If I go to the doctor 10 times with a sore throat, and I think each time it's a bacterial infection and I need an antibiotic, and 10 times a day, and I'm begging for an antibiotic, just give me an antibiotic, and the doctor 10 times out of 10 says, no, it's viral, you don't need an antibiotic. Now, one time out of 10, I'm gonna be right. One out of those 10 out of 10, I'm going to be right. One time out of 10, he's going to be wrong. The problem is, I don't know in advance which one of those time, one, one, nine times out of 10, which, which one of the times it's going to be. Had I, if I knew in advance, then everything would be great. Number four is the bacterial. All the others are viral, and everybody's happy. Shalom al Yisrael. The problem is, I think I'm always right. And the doctor thinks he's always right. So I don't have three choices, or I only have two choices as a policy. I could either follow myself constantly all the way through or follow the doctor all the way through. I can't jump back and forth because that doesn't make any sense at all. So I got to either follow myself, follow my instincts, or follow the doctor's instincts. Now, what are the results going to be? If to follow the doctor, so I'm batting 900. If I follow myself, I'm batting 100. You follow? So then I, I don't have a choice because the doctor always thinks he's right. It's got to be one or two. Either I'm going to always do what the doctor says or I'm always going to do what I say because I think I'm right. And nine times out of ten, I'm wrong. You follow. In marriage, it's very similar. A man who makes the decisions, decides family policies, you're going to be right 30% of the time. Your wife is going to be right 70% of the time. Women have a higher batting average. Now, I always think I'm right. And she always thinks she's right. So what do you do as a policy? Well, I want the most overall success will be, I'm going to let her make the decisions. And in marriage, I may let my wife make the decisions. It doesn't mean I don't have a say. And it doesn't mean, and I'm being very serious here, it doesn't mean I don't have a say. And I'll say my opinion, and I'll say what I think we should do, but I give her over, override, uh, override authority. And, and, and there's a reason for that. No, there are several benefits of it. Number one, if I do it my way and I mess up, you know, then, you know, just, just head for the hills, boy. You know, you know just you know, don't even come home, right? So better let her do it her way. Let her mess up. That I'll live with. But I know from experience that because a woman has a sense, HaKadosh Baruch gave them Bina Yaseira, a woman has a sense, and number one. And number two, a woman's decisions are, for the most part, not all, they're not perfect, don't, don't, they ain't perfect, but for the most part, they are devoid of ulterior motivation. A man is often making decisions based on, you know, what's in it for me and what the prestige and what were others going to think and so on. So women have that also. But they have the ability to withdraw from that better, in my experience, better than men do. And therefore, as a policy, I let them make the decision. Pre-marriage, pre-marriage, pre -marriage, uh, you should have a rabbi or a mentor who you can go to to help you make decisions. I personally will never, uh, almost never make decisions for people. What I will do is, uh, I do with my kids as well. I don't tell them what to do. I will paint out the playing field for them. I will tell them, this is option A, option B. If you're asking me, option A is a better option. And I'll try to make it clear so that it, it's easier for the person to make a decision. Guys ask me all the time, they're going out with a girl and they want to know if they should marry her or not. I will not tell a guy you should marry this girl. What I will tell them is, look at the benefits and look at the, look at the, the drawbacks. And the benefits are A, B, C, and D. There's a drawback over here and it could be a serious drawback, right? But there's a drawback. Now, this is what you're looking at. Now, you make a decision. And I could tell you what will happen if you make this decision, what will happen if you make this decision, but I'm not going to tell you what to decide. But I could try, try to paint it out. People with, with far superior Torah knowledge than myself can make it even clearer. Right? So the, better, the more Torah knowledge somebody has, the better the, the, he can help you to make the decision. But for a person who is, does not have, unless you're confident, some decisions are you know, no-brainers. But for a person who's got serious decisions that you got you to make, so you have to, uh, you have to have somebody who can help you. Like any other, if somebody's investing money, they're going to go get financial advice. And you're going to look for the financial advice of the best person you could possibly find. So when it comes to life advice, you look for somebody who can help you. But again, at the end of the day, you have to make your own decision. Yeah. Question. It's 10 words or less. Question. Yeah, 
you go, okay, and since then, what's been the problem? Uh, yeah, Chava, you're right. Chava, Chava messed up, but he had free choice. Okay, I go, leave, leave, leave biblical examples out, because biblical examples, people draw, people always draw on biblical examples. You know, Rashi's, women who want to wear tefillin, say, well, Rashi's daughters wore tefillin. Yeah, uh, well, you know, A, I, I don't know if it's true, but let's say, assuming it's true, but we don't know what else Rashi's daughters did, and we don't know when they wore tefillin. You know, it could be Rashi's daughter first got married, did everything their husbands wanted them to do, did not hawk, did not hawk about getting an aliyah, and then in the privacy of their home put on tefillin. So we don't know all the background. So now you can't give the biblical example. I'm talking practical right now. Practical. So what's the question? The question is how do you control the, the, like, the pressure and anger and all that stuff? Your pressure or their pressure? My pressure, because I, I, I'm very pressured of like, oh, you got to finish a four-year degree, you got to get, you got to get into the program, you got to finish, you got to get married, this and that, like. How do you, so it's a question, how do you handle parental pressure? Yeah. Okay. How you handle parental pressure mm -hmm. depends on what kind of communication you have with your parents. If your parents are people that you can speak to, and you're able to communicate with them, and it doesn't just turn into an emotional, an emotional shouting match, uh, that sort of thing. So then you speak like anything else. You communicate, and you present your, you present your position. You listen carefully and respectfully to their position, and then afterwards you consult with a rabbi or a mentor to find out now what should you do on a personal level, what you should do. You have to know the ground rules going in. The ground rules going in is you get nowhere by arguing with people. Never argue, because you get nowhere. The arguing gets you nowhere. And what you do is you go in and you have a discussion. And you try to paint the picture. At the end of the day, if you are a person who is independent, then you're going to be making your own decision. A person cannot live their life based on what their parents want them to do. You have to tell your parents, I take very seriously your considerations and I realize what you would like me to do, but at a certain point you have to make your own decisions. Because if you don't make your own decisions, so then there's no end to that sort of thing. Then your parents want you to live in a certain place, they want you to marry a certain person, they don't want you to go somewhere, they don't want you to live over here, they want you. you can't live your life for your parents. And if your parents, again, if you could speak to your parents, you will find out that your parents also didn't do everything they were told to do by their parents. Right? And that your parents themselves, plenty of times, their parents went up to them to do something and they did something else. Just parents sometimes forget that they were once 20 years old or, or 19 years old or 22 years old. But at a certain point in life, a person has to say, listen, I appreciate that. And, and the only thing your parents have over you is, number one, the mitzvah to respect them, which has limitations. Because if a person, for example, wants to leave home and go study Torah in, out, out, outside of state or in Israel, then you're not obligated by halacha to obey your parents, number one. And number two, uh, yeah, you have to honor your parents even when you're disagreeing with them. You cannot become disrespectful. But that you have a right to make your own decisions, that you have that right. Well, let's, just, let's just say they say you can't marry this girl, right? So the halacha says openly you do not have to obey your parents when they object to wearing a certain girl, unless she's not Jewish. But uh, uh, the, halacha says openly, the halacha says openly you don't have to obey. However, however, I would tell you, that if your parents do object to the girl that you're going to marry, you should take their opinion, weigh their opinion very carefully, because your parents probably know you better than you know yourself, and your parents want what's best for you. If you sense that your parents' objection is only because of their own peer pressure, and it's what others will say, that has nothing to do with you. But if your parents are genuinely the type of parents who the relationship is such that they're very concerned for you, they're only concerned about you, and they object to tell you, no, this girl is not good for you, then a person has to take their, their objection into consideration very seriously. Mayor, go ahead. Uh, just, uh, many times I, I see myself and other people that have learned valuable lessons from movies. So I just wanted to ask, uh, what, what's the reason that we really get away from all that culture since from time to time there is... Good, that's a very good question. There are a lot of things to learn from movies. Movies could be very educational because every time there's a movie on, I leave and I go and study. So movies could be very educational. <laughs> the, uh, uh, the truth of the matter is there are a lot of interesting things to see in movies. Our objection is not the medium of a screen 
and, P and, 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 the, and the camera and popcorn in the background. That's not our objection. Our objection to movies, our objection to movies or television or any of these things is because they are always inappropriate sites and inappropriate ideas that are being produced in the movies. First of all, let's just take, before we even get to immorality, let's just talk about violence, okay? The average American teenager, the average American teenager, I once read a study, the average American teenager by the time he was 18 years old, he has seen 20,000 murders on TV. <laughs> Okay? Now, that's just on TV. But that does something to you, right? That, that, that obviously does something to you. It doesn't make you into a more refined person, right? So it's, it's having an effect. Thing. That's just the violence, okay? Then you get to the immorality. And you get to, you know, in every movie nowadays, you know, in every movie nowadays, like, you know, people ask me about listening to non-Jewish mu music. I say, you're, that's not, it's not prohibited to listen to non-Jewish music as long as it's not a woman singing and it's not suggestive lyrics. So there goes non-Jewish music. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you, know the, you understand, it's, it, 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 it's not something that the medium is inherently prohibited. They do have what's called, hold, uh, hold for a second. They, they, they have what's called kosher movies. They, they have for from kids. They have kosher movies for girls. It's only women actors, actresses, you know, from Jewish women actresses, which may be a, a an oxymoron. But it's a it, it, you know, and, and you know, or they have a performance for girls, you know, where people can sing, where it's women singing for girls because the band can't can, let's say for women singing. So it's not the medium. Is there what to learn from? From movies, you know, there are always something you can pick up. Very interesting facts. Very what do you call it? The uh, uh, I, always, I was fascinated. I mean, there were movies that I saw when I was growing up. You know, I saw The Godfather. You know, mafia techniques were were fascinating. You know, so there's always something you can learn from different stuff. The problem is not the medium. The problem, as I say, the problem is not the medium. The problem is what happens with that medium. What's it used for for the most? And we know what it's used for for the most part. That's that that's the problem. The same thing when it comes to sports. Uh, uh, you, you know, sports is probably the most innocent of all diversions. The problem is, you know, you watch a football game, you know, you, you, you don't become a more refined person watching a football game. You know, oh, did you see that hit? You know, you, you know, you watch a boxing match and you see guys' heads snap back and in slow motion they show his head snap and the sweat coming off. You know, wow, you know, it, it doesn't make you a, that's ace of. It, so we all have a little bit of, we all need an outlet, otherwise because we're not machines. So everybody needs to know where to draw that line, you know, that, that, that sort of thing. But if somebody once, you know, I once told somebody, when you drive, particularly in Israel, especially in Israel, if you drive in Israel, you will not be the same person when you get out of that car. You will either be a better person or a worse person. You're not going to be the same person. Right. In America, you know, I remember driving in America. My son, who was, who was born and raised in Israel, so he was driving, he was driving in Columbus, uh, Ohio. And he came home, he said, you know, I get to this four-way stop, and I got to this four-way stop, and everybody stops, and they're waiting for me to pass. He said, I couldn't drive like that. Hey, he, you know, he drives in Israel. So that can't drive like that where everybody's polite and letting you go. How can you drive like that? You know, you got to get behind him. <laughs> he, he, he couldn't handle it. He was, he was scarred from driving in America. So, so the same thing, you know, when, when you come out of these things, you're either a better person or a worse person. It, 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 you know, and the idea that something's educational, you know, you always have to weigh the benefits. I, I'll tell you where it is extensive. Nathan, I haven't forgotten about you. I, this extends to the telephone. Is a telephone the medium called a telephone? I forget nowadays. Just the telephone that's attached to the wall. Where you're, yeah. Is the medium of a telephone a good thing? Yeah. Right? So everybody says yes. Why is it yes? Because you could communicate with people who says that's such a good thing. And you could, what do you call it? And if there's an emergency, you could call people and so on and so forth. On the other hand, do you think that there's been more Lush and Horace spoken in the world since before the telephone or after the telephone? Uh, is a, maybe it's not such a good thing. Maybe one person speaking a more Lush and Horace wipes out the, to all the benefits of a telephone. And when you stop and think that Rabbi Chaim Kedyevsky never had a telephone in his home, ever. A regular phone, never had a phone. Seems to, <laughs> seems to have done okay. So it's always a question of, yeah, what, look at the benefits. Yeah, but you always look at the benefits, you have to look at the drawbacks. What are the benefits and what are the drawbacks? If we want a very extreme example, it's an extreme example, and I'm only throwing it out as a question. I'm not going to go into a discussion and a, what do you call it? 
was recapturing the Western Wall in 1967 good for the Jews or not good for the Jews? Oh, good. I get to go to the Western Wall? Okay. On the other hand, have there been as a result of that Jews that have gone up on the Temple Mount and are now liable for Misa Bidei Shemaim with premature death? Yes. So maybe that eventuality outweighs the benefit of having captured the Western Wall. You know, there's nothing simple in life. Emotionally, you know, yeah, the Western Wall, you know, let's go to Dakota. You know, emotionally, yeah. But when you stop and think about it, I don't know, you could dive in a shul without people being chayv misa bidei shamayim. You could dive in a shul without people going up on the weather, you know, that, that sort of thing. So all these things are always, you have to weigh out the benefits, the cost, what's it called, the cost, something efficiency, the, the, the you know, it's not simple. It's not simple. But the movies, it's the medium of the movies. Nathan, what are we going to ask? Go ahead. That's a halacha. You can't listen to it. There are certain dubious leniencies about if you don't see her, if it's on on video. But for the most part, it's it's so it's. If you're it's on Spotify, you don't see her. You just listen to music itself. I don't know exactly what Spotify is, but if it's you're listening to a woman singing, then then there are certainly views in halacha that is prohibited. Even if you don't see her. Even if you don't see her. Okay. No more yeah. Yeah. Please. Again, your first name is. I don't know. Isaac. Isaac. Good. Okay, good. Excellent question. Why aren't we all wearing tcheles if they're producing tcheles? So first of all, there are several issues here. I'll tell you what the secondary issue is, then we'll get to what the, real, what the main issue is. The secondary issue is that we still don't know that that's the authentic tcheles. And anybody who could prove it, they, they think they could prove it, but they can't prove it. Uh, there are different people have claimed, that, and the proof that they can't prove it is because several different people have different proofs that they th that they have what's called trailers. So if it's, if it's been proven, so there should be no argument about it. That's the secondary issue. The primary issue is that we don't make these sort of decisions on our own. We turn to the leading halachic authorities of the generation, the Rabbi Moshe Feinstein's and the Rebel Yashiv's and the Rebbe Chaim Kenevsky's of the generation, and they are as... Uh, uh, um, concerned about meticulous Torah observance as we are. They are just as concerned. And yet, not one of them, the Chazon Ish and the Chafetz Chaim, none of them wore treles, even though there were people that their generations also claim that they have found authentic treles. It's not the first thing. Uh, the, uh, you, you know, the people in the factory, in the, in the uh, laboratories in Sfas in our generation are not the first people who claim they found authentic treles. So as a Torah Jew, I don't make my own decisions when it comes to issues like this. What I look to do is see what are the Torah authorities doing, because I start with the given. The given is they care about it a lot more than I do. They're more conscientious than I am. And therefore, since they're more conscientious, and they know all the ins and outs of all the arguments, and they're still not doing it, so then I don't do it. I have no reason to do it because they're not doing it. Obviously, they do not because if they felt it was important, they would make it. They would make it publicly known, like other things that are important. They make it publicly known that we should not be. That we should all be wearing tachelis. Number one. Then you get the technical issue of who said that that proves it. Who said that that proves it? And number three, the the leading halachic <laughs> authorities are of the opinion that we have lost the Masora, we've lost the tradition, and you can prove it from today till tomorrow, but you need a Masora, you need a tradition in order to determine Chelis, not a, uh, not, not a laboratory. But again, I, I've seen all these laboratories, right? I, I, I come there, 10 laboratories, all claim Chelis. So, you know, which one is the, which one is the correct one? Rabbi Henna Kleiner, uh, the Red Zinner Rebbe, in 1895, claimed that he found some sort of, some sort of uh, secret marine creature, and he did all, he put out an entire safer this thick, uh, claiming that he had proven to Chelis, and he was a massive Talmud Chochem and everything, but the, the leading Torah authorities of the generation did not accept it. Reds and their Hasidim do wear, do wear Chelis in our day and age, and a lot of people live in Sfas. But the, uh, the, 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 what do you call it, the, 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 we were not, you know, if Rabbi Moshe Feinstein didn't wear Chelis, he knew all about it. He knew everything I know he knew, and he still didn't wear Chelis. Yes, Eli? I was wondering, Right. So what's the point of wearing makeup if they're not trying to impress anyone? Good question. Good question. The women, 
uh, a woman is alive. It's an excellent question. Women, uh, the, the line in SNEA, so what we call modesty for women, A, there are certain l uh, uh, letter of the laws. The letter of the law is that a woman is not allowed to have her elbows exposed, she'll have her knees exposed, so on and so forth. Then you get to the spirit of the law. The spirit of the law is that a woman shouldn't do anything that is eye-catching eye and attractive, that is going to attract attention. And uh, it's so much so that a group, if you want to hear something really amazing, a group of frum women, teachers in one of the seminaries, I'm going to talk about serious frum, you know, the frumest of the frum, you know, the... The uh, what do you call it? You know, they were living in Bnei Brak, and they grew, They went to Rabbi Steinman, Rabbi Steinman Zatzal, and they asked him what could they do in the school to strengthen Sneas in the school in the girls' seminary. And we're talking about a from from seminary. You know, they were seriously from. And Rabbi Steinman said that when the teachers leave the building, the teachers. He didn't even talk about the students. He said when the women teachers leave the building, they shouldn't walk out in a group together. Because a group of women together is very, it draws a lot of attention. That wasn't what the teachers were expecting to hear, by the way, but that's what he said to them. That means that, that, a, that anything that draws attention is inappropriate, and there's often a spirit of the law as opposed to the letter of the law. On the other hand, the nature of a woman is that she is allowed to look presentable and put together. So a woman is allowed cosmetics, a woman is allowed to what he called it in number one. She's allowed the basic way, which it's a very difficult, you know, one man's basic is another man's extreme, you know, but a woman is allowed to feel good about, how, about her appearance. But it shouldn't be when the woman is putting on her makeup and is putting on her cosmetics or wearing her outfit, it shouldn't be for the sake of other men looking at her. As a matter of fact, the Gemara says that one of the, what, Choni Amagol had a grandson. And Choni Amagol's grandson uh, was, was Choni Amagol, did you ever hear of Choni the circle maker? He drew the circle and he got in and he said, God, I'm not getting out of the circle until it rains. And he had a grandson. And his grandson was one of the, was the God of They used to come to him to daven for rain. And his wife dressed herself up to, she, she dressed to the nines, what they called her. She dressed herself up, put on all of her fancy clothing and makeup in the house. So that when her husband comes home, he sees his wife looking her best. So he shouldn't be thinking about other women. But for a woman to put on, you know, sometimes women, women walk around the house, they, 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 they look like matter without form, you know, and, and then when, they get, when they're getting ready to go to the doctor, you know, all of a sudden they dress themselves up, or when they're going out, they dress themselves up. So many women will tell you they dress up for other women, which is true. Women dress for other women. But if a woman is dressing thinking about men, then it's already inappropriate. But a woman is allowed to look presentable, number one. And number two, a girl of marriageable age has to make sure she looks presentable because there are other women looking at her to check for a shidduch. Two follow-up questions, if I may. So why not, like, if a woman is wearing, like, something maybe like, like knee length or elbow length, but they're not doing that to impress a guy? Because they're... that, the halacha says, is inherent. Oh. There's an, that's inherently, inherently not, not acceptable. And then... Uh, if the whole idea is not about bringing attention, then why don't we do like what the Muslims do and like make them have like the hijab and like the because be, so ironically there are there are certain Jew from women who do I don't know what it's called uh, sometimes you see them they're wearing these uh, it looks like a, it looks like it looks like a portable tent uh, you know and and, and they're, they're 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 in their thing. And there are many who feel that that's inappropriate because that's different than what everybody else is doing, and therefore that's drawing attention to them. But, well, it's, it's, but everybody isn't, and everybody isn't going to. And since everybody, well, women do have to keep themselves covered, to, so everything should be covered. That's our our version of what's it called, the hijab or whatever it is. But but at least our women, when they cover themselves, don't go around trying to stab soldiers. But the uh, <laughs> the uh, you know they don't keep a knife under there or explosives. But the uh, the, uh, the 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 women the women are not expected to do anything beyond what the social norm is, as long as it is appropriate. And a woman who wears one of these things, so one of the counter arguments. Again, I'm not taking a position here. I'm just telling you that it happens to me. Draw more attention. That draws more attention. Even in a neighborhood, I'll tell you, even in a neighborhood where the women tend to dress on Shabbos, they dress nicely, very nice, they dress up. And during the week, they wear regular, respectable clothing. And there's a woman who feels she likes to dress up like wearing like Shabbos clothing all week, which are all tzniyas. 
But then she has to ask herself if in her society that's not calling more attention to herself simply because of the contrast with the other women. These are very de delicate things, very delicate things. And uh, at the end of the day, HaKadosh Baruch knows what a person is, what a person is. Dylan, go ahead. I have some friends and family who have been, um, or going through like the reform conversion. And my, my father, he, he did it. And he says things sometimes that like make a mockery, like making fun because I'm not kosher food, or like he, he honestly was very against me coming to yeshiva and being more religious because I think it's like threatening to uh -huh. him. And he, he told me the other day he wants to be buried in a Jewish cemetery, and it's like I don't I don't even know how to respond. I I when I, when I hear this stuff, it's like I would say the first thing I would say is we'll talk about it after you die. Oh. And, and, you know the the uh, the, the uh, what, what call it? that's a that's already a, a, you're 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 into the realm of halachic questions and yeah, practical. Like I don't know what to say. So that. you that's something you need to speak to Rabbi Bredo. It's about uh, okay. uh, about what, what you call it. You, you change the subject. That's the first thing you know. But as far as what the actual halach is, you'd have to speak to Rabbi Bredo. It's about that. Yeah. that. Okay, but it is uh, it's very admirable that you that you're able to. The most important thing is to maintain your composure and not let people rattle you. When people attack, attack, you know, and they, they, they everybody's got an opinion. Yeah, that's good. It's as long as you don't, don't get rattled by it. That's all. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, uh, Jonathan. I know, I know you don't like these kind of wide questions, but we have the description. But you'll ask anyway. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. All the, the sort of all the journeys that the Jews took coming yeah. out of Egypt. Yeah. Yeah. And then we have sort of right after when we come to Canaan, we have Hashem What's, asking the Jews to commit like. Wholesale slaughter, basically. Go ahead. What's the I question? Be, sorry, that might be that might be an unfair representation. But he's what's the question? The question is, what's the connection between depicting like all the journeys they've gone through? And okay, then that's a commit. specific Chumash question. Leave, leave, leave that for the parsha. Okay, I, I, in general, I'm mean, today's general general question type. Yeah, Brent, Blake, go ahead. So while we're here, there's a lot to that. There's a lot that we're learning and accounting for, like the Ramidos and a lot of the learnings from all the different classes. So. How do we make a proper Hezron that factors in a nice chunk of everything without driving us crazy in introspection? That's, that's also that's a very important question. In other words, uh, when you're dealing with Yiddishkeit, how do we maintain balance and not drive ourselves nuts? And this I mean, requires everybody, everybody being very, very much in touch with who they are and what level they're holding on. So for example, let's say you read about a great rabbi who was in the habit of fasting every Monday and Thursday. You know, there are people who did that. There were great rabbis who were in the habit of fasting every Monday or other, other rabbis who never ate more than one portion of food. They would make sure they never ate more than one portion of food. Anytime we read about things or hear about things which are on a very high level, it's wonderful for us and we could incorporate it into our life at our level. That means, oh, this rabbi fasted on Monday and Thursdays. Maybe for myself, what I'll do is next time I have lemon meringue pie, I'll limit it to one piece. I'm not fasting, and I'm not going to limit myself, and I'm not, I'm not doing what... And if Chaim Kinevsky went on one and a half hours sleep per night, or two hours sleep per night, so maybe I'll incorporate it in myself, and instead of sleeping till 10 tomorrow morning, I'll try to get up at 9, cut down that extra unnecessary hour of sleep. But a person has to be very, very careful to know who they are. And again, this often requires a mentor to balance, you know. And my uh, 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 standard for anything that a person is trying to grow in Yiddishkeit, are you getting nervous? Are you getting nervous about it? I'm trying to say that I'm trying to dive in more slowly and have more kavana. And it's making me nervous, then you're not holding by that level yet. Then don't do it because you're getting nervous. And you shouldn't be nervous in Yishkat. You should be besimcha. Besimcha doesn't mean jumping on a trampoline on top, of a, on top of a car out in public with a bottle of beer in your hand. That's not besimcha or a bottle of vodka. That's not simcha. Simcha means that you're upbeat and you're, in th you're, you're, upbeat and you're energized. That's what simcha is. And you walk around smiling as opposed to frowning and walk around that you look like you're enjoying life as opposed to, my goodness, I've, been, I've fallen into the clutches of this oppressive, demanding religion. Right? And if a person is taking on ideas, taking on a behavior, and you're finding that you're overwhelmed, then 
you're getting nervous, that means you're not doing something right. And therefore you need to speak to somebody and find out what needs to be cut. This is not that you've you bit off more than you could chew. I know people who want to become tzaddikim overnight. I want to be a tzaddik. I've been, I've been not great my entire life. I feel guilty about my behavior. I want to be a tzaddik. Don't be a tzaddik. Just be a mensch. Don't try to be a tzaddik. It takes a while to be a tzaddik. Just be a mensch. And if you take it out and say, I'm going to help anybody who asks for my help anytime, anywhere, under any circumstances, and you're not really that person, all that's going to do is it's going to drive you batty. And therefore, a person has to have personal guidance on as soon as you feel, you know, something doesn't feel right here. And it's very important to feel, this doesn't feel right. I'm trying to do something that he's doing. That's often a problem is looking at other people. I'm trying to do what he's doing. It doesn't feel right for me. Then you need to have guidance because it may not be the right thing for you. Yes? This is kind of a two-faceted question in regards to uh, secular Jewish friends that I have, uh, or that one has. To what extent is it my responsibility to guide them away from Averas? Good. And to what extent should I be maybe distancing myself from them if they're so far off the path, but yet good. they're a good friend I have? Good. You have zero responsibility zero responsibility to guide them. You have to first guide yourself. And guiding yourself ends up becoming the best way to guide them. Somebody had asked earlier about, uh, uh, who was it? Uh, somebody asked earlier about, uh, 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 um, you can't tell anybody or get anybody to do anything. Mm -hmm. And experience shows that the only way, somebody asked, what do I do about my, what do I do about friends who are a negative influence? friends who are a negative influence. The answer is the more you refine yourself, your negative friends will, by definition, start leaving you alone. The better you are and the more refined you are, the guys who are less refined are going to start drifting away by, on their own. You don't need, to, you don't need to, to do anything actively. On the other hand, you can maintain a connect. You can, certainly, it's a good to maintain a Kesher, to maintain a, uh, a communication with your secular male friends. There's, with secular male friends, it is certainly a good idea to maintain a Kesher, but it's got to be on your terms. So, for example, when you go home, if you go home for a visit, your friends want to go out, it's only going out where they're doing something where you yourself would do it if you weren't with your friends. So you're already in a place where you wouldn't be going to a bar, then they can't go bar with your friends. Right? If you would go bowling, so you could go bowling with your friends. If you're a person who still goes to movies, you can go to movies with your friends. But it depends where you are. But you don't do anything for maintaining the, 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 uh, uh, the connection that you wouldn't be doing. You're only doing it for the sake of trying to keep them close. That you don't do. That you don't do. You keep the connection, and there's nothing wrong with keeping the connection. And you should keep the connection. And you will find, by definition, that you're going to have certain friends are going to drift away because they think you're a religious fanatic. They're not going to have, they feel we have nothing in common. And I've been asked this by Bali Chuva. I had one guy here at the yeshiva years ago. He told me every time he went home, he, he was the youngest of four brothers. One of the brothers was intermarried. The other two brothers were, were whatever. But none of them were very. Every time he came home, so it turned into a lynch. They would go out with his brothers, and they would just turn into a bash session on religion. So finally, he was a very good guy. Very, 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 uh, very, he had his head screwed on. So finally, he said to his brothers, listen, if every time I come home and we get together, you know, you're not going to change me, and I'm not going to change you. If all it's going to turn into is an unpleasant bashing, so I said, I'm just not going to come home. So I come home to visit. So then what do you talk to your brothers about? What do you talk to your friends about? Well, what did you ever talk about? You talked about sports, right? You talked about beer, and you talked about girls. So girls you can't talk about, right? <laughs> but you can certainly talk about sports. You certainly had things in common. You talked about money. You had certainly had things in common other than religion. I mean, you stop and think about, honestly, how much religion did you talk to your friends about anyway? Right? So whatever it was that you did have in common, you played ball with them, so play ball with them. What's wrong with it? You went golfing with them, so go golfing with them. What's wrong? Nothing wrong with it. You can maintain a connection. If you really want to, you could, and if they want to, you could. It's not a problem. There are many people who have maintained very good, healthy relationships with their family, where their families haven't moved one iota religiously, and with their friends, where their friends haven't moved one iota religiously. 
but if you're going to be an annoying person and you're going to be and they're going to be feeling an underlying you know that you're trying to get them to make brachas or put on tzitzis or or to be from that, that sort of thing they're going to sense that and and everything you're doing you're being overly friendly so that they'll get interested in finally asking you so why are you religious you know your whole goal that's your whole agenda is to get them talking about why you're religious they'll sense it and then it's going to drive everything right away and you should go in there i'm not planning on being a car of anybody i'm not trying to make any from i'm going there just to maintain a friendship and then if they bring it up, then I'd be willing to talk to them. Can you maintain a friendship with non-Jews? You could maintain a friendship with non-Jews, but in general, in general, our, 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 we, we try to keep, you see that there are even uh, safeguards instituted in the Gemara, not to drink their wine and not to eat their cooked food, to maintain a distance between up, us and them. Well, if they cook even kosher food. Uh, you can't, they, there are safeguards that were instituted to maintain, to try to maintain a distance between us and the non-Jews. So you could be decent, you certainly have to be decent with non-Jews, and you can be friendly with non-Jews, but we don't try not to socialize with them. In other words, uh, uh, in the office, you can be friends with them in the office, as long as obviously it doesn't turn into crude, crude uh, uh, office talk, that sort of thing. But we try to maintain uh, an arm's length uh, as far as socially. Yeah, Miguel, go ahead. Good. Good. The, the rule is generally if a person feels, you know, I think I'd like to try taking on something else, then sometimes it's worth trying, right? And then seeing how it feels. And if a person tries and they see, so I'll give you one, one, one classic example. Let's say a person decides, I'm not recommending this by any story, let's say a person decides, I want to work on my physical desires, so I'm going to try cutting out dessert. I usually eat dessert, and I'm going to try not eating dessert. It's not necessary, so I don't need it for health wise. I just enjoy it. Let's see if I could handle not eating dessert just to try to push myself a little bit to that, that extra, okay? So a guy skips dessert. And, uh, you know, it's a nice dessert. There's a nice piece of cake or whatever it is, a nice piece of pie, and a guy skips dessert. How do you feel an hour later? Do you feel, wow, that was really, that was really uplifting. I, saw, I exerted self, you know. Or... You sit down and open up a Gemara, and they say, Amar Rava, dessert, right? and, and, and it's still on your head. If it's still on your head an hour later, you know what, just go eat the dessert. You know, you're not holding by that. That's not, that's not, that's not where we're holding. Isn't it natural to like, have that kind of like, pull against yourself when you're trying to read? No, because there, there are many people who, the, the, the pull is, a, it, it depends when the pull is. There, everybody has that pull while you're facing the test. Everybody has the pull for the dessert. That everybody has. Once you get past that, then what is the next stage? What's the next stage? An hour later, are you regretting it? Or an hour later, do you feel, wow, that was energizing. I feel, and you learn better, and your mitzvahs are better, and you're treating people better because of that. That, that, added, to your, that added to your entire overall energy. If that's what happened, then it's a good thing. And if you're feeling tense and nervous, then you're not ready for it. This is only in permissible areas. If something's forbidden, then, then I don't care what kind of mood you're in. Right? If, if the person's in a, they could be on an airplane and they have a non-kosher meal and they don't have your kosher meal, I don't care what kind of bad mood you're going to be in, you just can't eat it. But this is, this is for the optional areas. Yeah, Blake, go ahead. But with your friend, going back to the friends, if you're different or, or less religious, if you're talking about sports and money and all this, doesn't that reduce on your, your, your refinement levels? Only if you cross the line into inappropriate, crude behavior. I once asked a rabbi when I, because I grew up modern Orthodox, and I wanted to, I was meeting some modern Orthodox friends, and I asked him how I'm supposed to behave. He told me, just behave the same way you always used to. I said to him, yeah, but I'm not really like that anymore. He said, yeah, but they don't know that. They don't need to know that. Because all they need to know is that, they, that, with, that any encounter with you is a pleasant encounter. What you really are is something else, but they should have a pleasant experience. If they have a pleasant experience with you as a religious person, then the chances are much better that they will investigate the religion. But if they have an unpleasant experience with you, because all you do is all you do is, is is talk Aramaic and imply that they're that they're going to go to that they're going to burn a Gehenna, uh, so so then 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 you're going then, then, then you're going to lose them. Uh, the, the, who's interested in having anything to do with you? You make me uncomfortable. Last one. Go ahead, Eli. Uh, I was just going to ask a quick question. Like, what's the difference between 
What makes you think it's a quick question? <laughs> it was a quick question. Who said it's a quick answer? <laughs> uh, I, uh, the answer is that uh, my, the, uh, ostensibly, you know, I, uh, modern orthodox, the expression modern orthodox does not come from Sinai. So it's a man-made expression. Uh, uh, it, it, it apparently refers to incorporating modernity with Torah. Uh, but then again, I also use a train and a car and telephones. So I'm pretty modern also, so I'm not sure exactly where the line is. If it involves compromising halacha, so it doesn't matter what you call it, it's an avera. So if somebody says, well, I'm modern orthodox, therefore I'm not obligated to do this, or I could be uh, 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 less conscientious in areas that I'm obligated, uh, so then I don't care what you call it, then you're not doing what you have to do. Yeah, uh, if a woman wears a sleeve elbow above the sleeve, uh, the sleeve above the elbow because she's modern orthodox, or if she's wearing a head covering that exposes more than a tefach of hair, so then, you know, that's already transgressing the letter of the law, not the spirit of the law. So I, I don't know to this day, I don't know modern orthodox exactly where that line is. Often people use the superficial definition that if you're wearing a black suit and a black coat and a black hat, then you're Haredi. And if you're wearing a knitted yarmulke and a white shirt and you with the adavan without a hat and a jacket, then you're modern orthodox. Uh, you know, these are all very, very superficial. Uh, I think that more important is that in your own mind, if you, in your own mind, if you would be invited to a Haredi wedding, uh, you'd be very surprised if there wasn't a mechitza there. And if you were invited to a modern orthodox wedding, you'd be very surprised if there was. So that tells you something about a life approach and where the emphasis is on the religion and whether the emphasis is on the modern. That's right. But that is already something that's very, very tricky. And, and uh, you know, each person has their own idea of what it refers to. All right, guys. To